Shane, would you like to start and introduce our guest for today? Okay, I am quite excited about our guest. When uh, we've spoken on Twitter, he's referred to Twitter teachers as the Gilderoy Lockhart of the world. So it's only apt that we've got Mr. Firth from Hands Up Podcast with us today. And we're going to be talking about Chamber of Secrets. Thank you for uh, bringing that up again, since it was many moons ago when I probably had about, what, 100 followers on Twitter, you being possibly the only one of them. So thank you for bringing up that little controversy of mine. <laughs> it's appreciated. I mean, if it works, we can link back to that tweet so that, you know, people can see exactly <laughs> what you thought. Jordan, can you just explain what was your Lockhart analogy? It just reminds me a bit like quite a few Twitter teachers in that just gallivants around, you know, like, like people do on social media, displaying his achievements that actually are his, so he's, he's stolen from someone else. It's a bit like a teacher just going on Pinterest, just saving all those ideas, saving all those images, and then just posting them on Twitter and getting thousands of followers. But actually, you get them in a the classroom. They're no better than anybody else. He's the sort of person who I think his mum probably bigged him up as a kid and told him he was like really special and intelligent and handsome, and he just somehow believed it. That's the vibe I get from him. And I think Kenneth Branagh, he nails the character. He plays him as like that guy who... Probably slipping into his mid to late forties, who tips the waitress in cash and goes, "Here you go, love," with a wink card that might wear like a polo shirt to the beach because he doesn't quite have the beach body, but he still wants to look good as he's drinking <laughs> his Bloody Mary. The sort of guy that will bring like divorcees to Bella Italia and tell them that it's pronounced bruschetta, or the one that in the school hall he'll try and lift as many folding chairs as possible, and as they sort of clatter all over the floor, he'll be like, "Whoops, whoopsie." Yeah, he's not my favourite character in a film ever, <laughs> is a, which might be a bit of an understatement. But That was all so specific that someone's ears are definitely burning right now. That was all way too specific. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when we first meet Lockhart, he's in the bookshop, he's giving out all of his books and stuff. And one of the things that annoys me in the film is that Hermione and Ginny are all really fawning over him and maybe it is the age thing but i just feel like they wouldn't actually really be that bothered about this like weird 45 year old man in like a frock coat i just feel like it rings false you're um forgetting that all the other male teachers are ancient so therefore he's the first good looking teacher that's turned up in a very long time and so it's only natural and i think that's the character that they wanted to you know present where he's that good looking that daughters and mothers and grandmothers would fancy him. The school that I work at, I was the first ever male primary school teacher that they had there. And um, speaking from experience, that, that doesn't happen <laughs> just because <laughs> you're a bit younger or you're a male. Does it happen now? The, the swimming from the, the mothers? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, never. That sounds like <laughs> someone's covering their back in case. They <laughs> no comment. <laughs> I mean, if we look also at Lockhart's lesson plan, so he has that, his first lesson is the the Cornish Pixies, right? Where he just kind of like throws them out into the lesson. What did we think about? I mean, we don't like him as a person. Did we think this was a good idea as a lesson? I thought that was a train wreck of a lesson where in his head he thought, this is a really good idea. And then in actual fact, because he didn't think of all the possible outcomes that could happen, he just ended losing control and then he left. He left Ron, Hermione and uh, Harry in charge, didn't he, to, to get it sorted, which speaks volumes because they are only in year eight at the moment. What would have happened if uh, SLT walked into that lesson? Well, they wouldn't have seen him, would they? Because he left uh, halfway through. So so he would he would have got the brunt of it until afterwards. This is the thing. I feel like all the other teachers get that he's an idiot. And yet they let him stay there for absolutely ages. There doesn't seem to be like, any, like after that lesson, presumably kids are going around saying, like, this lesson was a disaster, like, McGonagall, you need to sort this out, what's going on? And yet he just stays there for forever. There doesn't see, It just seems to be in Hogwarts that Dumbledore decides if you're a teacher and then you just stay there until Dumbledore's like, no, 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 you need to leave. The Defence Against the Dark Arts job is, is cursed, isn't it, in the book? They never manage to hold down a teacher. But, yeah, you do wonder why Dumbledore hide him in the first place because you'd feel like that he's smart enough to know that he's a bit of a fraud. Well, my theory was that Dumbledore employs him to expose him, but in doing so, he does put all the other kids at quite a lot of risk. 
I think the other thing to probably uh, take note of is once they're in employment, they're covered by union rules and regulations. Yeah, that's interesting you say that, actually, because when I watched it and there's a bit where Dumbledore gets suspended and Lucius Malfoy talks about, oh, me and the governing body. And I just think, guys, oh, so weird that we, even wizarding schools have parent governors. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I picked up on that. The uh, overactive parent who is part of the governing body who then goes on to exert their parental rights on what should be happening in the school. And even in real life, you know, a parental complaint is taken really, really so seriously. I like the fact that it mirrored that situation quite well. The duel with Snape. In the context of the film where we hate Lockhart, the fact that Snape's like slagging off what he's doing is pointing out that he didn't show them how to block spells first and stuff. What do we think about, because I've experienced this, teachers that passive aggressively criticise what you've done to the kids? One of the rare moments that you ever really root for Snape, isn't it? But then he very quickly kind of reminds you why he's so unlikable when he chooses um, Malfoy to go up against Harry instead of Ron because his wand's broken but I mean at least he knows what makes for good entertainment the whole year group were there I'd be like yeah actually if there's two people I want to see go at it in a duel it's these two so nice one Snape thanks for providing the entertainment. Snape clearly knows the kids better than Lockhart and he knows that Ron's got a broken wand he knows that there's rivalry between Harry and um, Malfoy and that that kind of understanding of students takes some doing you need to be teaching for a while you need to have taught the kids for a while to know what works and to know what makes them tick as well as them knowing what makes the teachers tick which leads me to something I really wanted to speak about in this film which is the safeguarding in Hogwarts is absolutely dire because all the teachers know that Ron's wand is broken and McGonagall's like, oh, your wand's broken, you'd get sorted. No one ever fixes it for him. No one ever tells him how to fix it. And he's going through this whole film with this wand that's like disastrously going off at every opportunity and literally nobody ever sorts this out for him. And I think that was pretty poor. I was quite disappointed with McGonagall, who's normally my favourite. You will have mentioned it, the Philosopher's Stone sending children into a dangerous forbidden forest just for detention is also questionable, <laughs> isn't it? So um, I feel like that's probably quite mild <laughs> compared to some of the safeguarding issues in that school and the fact that in this film is it what three or three or four students get petrified and very very lucky not to have been killed and then over the top they disgust don't they school closing they just get, they just keep going don't they they're not fussed yeah the, the biggest thing that they put in place is that all students must stay in their dorms yeah like this really made me think of the situation we're kind of in now where it's just like everyone is desperately trying to keep a school open even though everyone knows it's basically really unsafe yeah you're exactly right actually it does it does mirror that quite well a question for the both of you what houses would you put yourselves in i've done many quizzes online and it always seems to come out as Ravenclaw. This is actually a bone of contention for me because I always felt as quite a studious person I would be in Ravenclaw, even though, to be honest, that's definitely the most boring house to go into. However, every single time I've done a quiz, I always end up in Hufflepuff. And the first time that happened, I was actually really upset and felt like I did not want to be in Hufflepuff because it felt like they were just where you went if you didn't have a personality. But now someone actually explained to me that Hufflepuff really the most egalitarian house because they're very accepting of everyone. They're not elitist like Slytherin and Loki, Gryffindor. And they're also not bores who just read books all the time like Ravenclaw. So actually, Hufflepuff is the house to be. I've now, I'm now a committed Hufflepuff, Hufflepuffian. Yeah, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? <laughs> that sounds like a Gryffindor to me. No, well, when I was <laughs> doing one, and I, um, yeah, I got put in Slytherin, and I thought, like, oh, I knew I was like, a bit of an arsehole, but I didn't think I was like cartoonishly evil. So <laughs> it's a bit, it's a bit of a wake up call. Did anything change after you uh, realised that you were in Slytherin? Yeah, I just thought I'd own it and just use it as an excuse for my behaviour. So next time I make a controversial Twitter comment, I'll just be like, yeah, but I'm in Slytherin. So what do you expect? Well, in your defence, the fact that when like things get real and Voldemort starts going back, that they just incarcerate all of Slytherin because they can't trust them is pretty messed up, let's be honest. I agree with that. And I think that, especially in Harry's year, they were just set up for failure. At the end of the first film, Dumbledore set up their kind of whole school life. But where, when he gives, obviously, the extra points to Gryffindor to um, make it so they win, they beat Slytherin like, by a couple of points. I question his logic. Oh, look at this house full of ambitious and prideful wizards with a history of turning evil. It would be a shame if some authority figure were to embarrass and alienate them <laughs> and it's like why <laughs> why would you do that surely your own behavior management technique there would make you realize god just keep just leave it as a draw you don't need to give those extra points to devil 
I'll just give him a few less. He just sets them up for that failure, doesn't he? Just because, like I say, they're the cartoon villains of the school, aren't they? That's such a good point because I always think of Dumbledore as being like this like kindly, like cozy figure. And yet re-watching all these films, Dumbledore's very shady. And this is actually the last film, isn't it? Where you have the kind of calmer Dumbledore actor because the guy died. So after this one, you get the angry, vaguely Irish Dumbledore. However, you're right. He makes a lot of very questionable decisions, actually, as Ed Master. At the very end of the film, when the exams get cancelled as a school treat do we think that is a good idea when you reflect on everything that's happened this year with exams being cancelled and how everyone from the students to the staff have responded to what a disaster that was in reality we can actually confirm no it's not a treat yeah i like to imagine all the kids are like yes and all the teachers are like great so we've now got to go through and look at all of our predicted grades and give them to dumbledore fantastic do you think that still happens even in hogwarts Dumbledore doesn't seem like the kind that really cares for data and statistics true that's like umbridge era i feel like mcgonagall would care i feel like mcgonagall would be on her data there's a scene when she's teaching it's just after the chamber of secrets has been opened and none of the kids really know anything about the Chamber of Secrets. And Hermione puts her hand up and she says, can we ask you about the Chamber of Secrets? And you can see there's the look of hesitation. She obviously is thinking whether it's appropriate or not to tell the students. But she chooses to tell the students. I quite like the fact that they feel comfortable enough to ask McGonagall because she's that kind of warm strict where if she said no, they would have accepted, actually, it's probably best if we don't know. But if we are going to get an answer, she's the teacher that we're going to get an honest and open answer from. That's me in a nutshell, that a student asks me a question that's going to lead me off on a tangent for 20 minutes. Bring it on. <laughs> yeah, let's go for it. Let's go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, I love going off piste on questions that the kids ask. There is that trust there. And I think McGonagall is, without a doubt, the best teacher at that school just in terms of her behavior management she's really she's firm isn't she but fair she's she's really honest she's clearly a very very good teacher i, I think she's my my favorite professor there yeah she's mine too I, it's interesting isn't it because she seems like quite an austere character and you would not think like she's not like a fun teacher like lupin in the third film or you know she's she's clearly very strict and doesn't take any nonsense and yet you respond to that don't you because it's it's consistent and it's justified she's very fair and i'm glad you brought that moment up shane because i did also pick that up i I really also like the openness and i think i would like to be more like that i'm a bit more like this is what we need to get done and i don't take irrelevant questions well quote unquote irrelevant questions and actually i think it's good to be you know a bit more open like you are jordan just sort of let the conversation flow and i like that she doesn't shut it down she's not like it's not a school it seems here at least in her view that runs on like a need to know basis like they share information with the kids if they think it's relevant i mean they still don't close the school but that's another matter but they're still telling them what's going on and keeping them informed and i think that is good practice and warm strict chain i think you're absolutely right she is like the definition of warm strict and how to do that i uh, see myself in a little bit in this film as well in herbology with professor sprout where they are replanting mandrakes and neville faints and one of the kids, the kids go professor sprout neville's just fainted and she goes, yes, well, just leave him there. <laughs> it's the, the wizarding world equivalent of saying, just put a wet paper towel on it. <laughs> It'll be fine. <laughs> I feel like when we do transition, this needs to be, right, a column in the spreadsheet. This child will be fine after a wet paper towel. I feel like the secondary school equivalent of the wet paper towel is to give it 10 minutes. That lesson with Miriam, Miriam Muggley's Professor Sprout is also another incredibly dangerous lesson where if those like flimsy little headphones come off, they're basically dead. I am... Um revisited this book not that long ago because uh, I started reading the illustrated editions and this is the first time in ages I've watched a film and when you look online and you see sort of people's list of favourite films and favourite books it, it always comes near the bottom just this chamber of secrets but I really like this film I think it's the plot's relatively fascinating like there's a monster with Medusa like powers living somewhere in Hogwarts and kids are getting picked off one by one, you introduce Harry's ability to talk to snakes again, and you find out that it's really rare and only possessed by like dark wizards. You've got the whole thing with the Tom Riddle's diary, which which actually sets it up really well for later books when you find out that it's it's a Horcrux. It's the first film we learn about the Hogwarts founders and, and wizard racism, which stays really relevant in the following books. I think it sets up quite a lot in in sort of the books to come, and I think I enjoy it better than the others, the first two films especially. Because in some ways, sometimes the kind of the teen angst irritates me a little in the later ones. They, they kind of lack that sense of, of childlike wonder that you kind of fall in love with with the first books. I find it really interesting that you talked about teen angst because 
for those of you who don't know, Jordan, you are a primary school teacher, right? Yeah. What group do you teach? I teach year two, so a six and seven year old. Okay, so both Sean and I are secondary school teachers. For me, my more favourite books are the older ones um, when they are taking more responsibility, that you can see their growth and them becoming young adults. So it is quite interesting that you as a primary school teacher prefer the earlier books. I certainly, I don't know about you, Sean, but I certainly prefer the later books. I just want to bring in, you know, at the beginning, when the two boys can't get to school, they literally risk their lives to get to school. And I wanted to ask the question, have you ever, under any circumstances, tried to get to school because you're going to be late or you didn't want to miss lessons? For me, it was a bit of a strange scene. It kind of says what kind of student I was, but if there was something that was getting in the way of me getting in school, I would have just stayed at home. Oh, there's like two inches of snow. I was like, well, I'm blocked in. Never <laughs> mind, best stay at home and watch some DVDs. Never mind, I tried. <laughs> but these two boys, come rain or hell, they will get to school, whether they're breaking laws, whether they're flying across London and risking being seen. And then they've, they've obviously had that traumatic experience with the Wampin Willow. Yeah, I think for Harry's alternative, isn't it, is to go back to the Dursleys. He would probably rather risk death uh, than do that, um, especially since he needed to be break, like broken out of there, didn't he, right at the start of the, of the film. So I think it makes sense for Harry, I guess, in a way, but then you just think that he could just go back to the borough with Ron and then they'd sort it out. And like, if, the, if they turned around and went back to the borough, said to mum, mum, look, Harry seems to be not being able to get through the platform. Is there any other way that we can get to school? Maybe we'll try again tomorrow kind of situation. But no, they, they steal the car, they fly across London, they almost get killed, and then they face almost being expelled by Snape. It just sets up the scene where Ron gets his, his howler, doesn't it? Like that, That's the only sort of narrative purpose that has. So I do like the moments with Molly, though, where she is always really angry at Ron. I think it, it might be when they first break him out and, and they walk in and she's like, where have you been, Harry? How wonderful to see you, dear. Bed's empty, no, no, car gone. And I love the way she is. With her. It's never Harry's fault. I love that about her. That is a very classic mum thing, to be loved with teammates and be horrible to you. I think that's universal. I just wanted to build on the fact that as a primary teacher, Jordan, I, was, I always think about this as well when I read these books. Like, So you really have Hogwarts and it seems to be the only secondary magic school in this country it's implied at least we hear about nothing else do we think in this world there is also like a primary school a magic primary school because it doesn't seem like it It seems like they just start their education at 11 but like what are they doing before that are they just with their parents do they do we do you think there are feeder schools like what do we imagine on the podcast that i do we, we had the harry potter special and that that was a question that got asked i remember looking it up and i think the vibe is that they are they're homeschooled sort of right up until they they go to Hogwarts um, and then obviously you've got your muggle-born children that that would go to normal primary schools. I, d I don't know why sort of all the muggle-born kids when they get to Hogwarts don't just kind of go you know we've got these things called pens right and <laughs> notebooks like they're still using parchment and paper for all the good that magic does it's like why are you still using parchment and ink I know it's quite it's got a nice sense of nostalgia about it, but you know, just get a just get a biro. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. It's like the magic makes life so much easier in some ways, and yet, like it's like Mr. Weasley soaps, like fascinated and amazed by things like toasters and escalators, and yet they don't seem to be able to connect that to like like the fact that they could just use magic. I guess maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's that they just use magic for everything, and so I guess maybe it's like they just use magic to write. Or that's the other thing, you know, like how do they learn to read and write? Is this their parents teaching them? Like. Obviously, I know, you know, that's not something that she'd want to spend time on because it would be interesting. But I do think about this, like, well, how does this happen? So, because that's quite a big onus, isn't it, on their parents to teach them everything until they get to secondary school? Well, yeah, and, and bear in mind, when they get to secondary school, there's no math lessons. You know, <laughs> that's it then. So they kind of, maybe they do rely on magic. I think Hermione in, in the third book takes, I think she takes a subject called arithmancy, I think it's called in the Harry Potter world, which... I think is the magic of numbers, but it's, you know, it's not compulsory. So it's like, as soon as they get to secondary school, maths, English, you know, God knows like what the grammar's like in Fantastic Beasts and where to find them in those sorts of books, because they don't learn anything. 
Well, this is the thing. So if you think the Chamber of Secrets is predicated on this idea that like the the muggle kids or the or whoever are like inferior to the magical ones, but don't you think like the kids who have had normal primary education would be getting Hogwarts? Like, this is so embarrassing. They literally can't even add up. Hogwarts is basically a private school, isn't it? Like it's invitation only. Do we think there are like comprehensives that are like really struggling where like, you know, there are loads of cover teachers and loads of like naughty magical children? Do you imagine that's there as well? Do you think it's literally just Hogwarts? Like a like a pro for, for naughty magical magical kids. I, I I don't feel like there's that much of a rehabilitation in Harry Potter. It's kind of like you do something wrong, you get thrown in Azkaban and there you will rot <laughs> forever. Yeah, because it's this where we find that about Hagrid, don't we, that he he went to Azkaban. And I feel like the film really skirts over that. And it's only in later films you see that Azkaban's absolutely terrifying. But they're just, they're so chill about it. Like, oh yeah, he went to Azkaban for a bit, you know, and then he got, like, uh, expelled from the school. And they, they really underplay that, I think. I don't think that, I don't know if they mentioned it in the film, but Lockhart, he spends the rest of his life in St. Mungo's, I think it's called, which is like a wizard wizarding hospital. But yeah, he's basically just put in a asylum for the rest of his life. A sense of justice done, even if it's done quite comically, kind of in the film, like where he says, uh, "This is an odd sort of place, isn't it? Do you live here?" And then, uh, and then Ron does the thing that is apparently so easy to do in movies, where you just hit someone on the back of the head and it knocks them out instantly. I just can never imagine that that is ever the case in real life. I had serious issues with that particular moment because Ron is quite. Um scared person and for him to just literally pick up a rock whack his teacher on the head with it just seemed so like second nature that was the most unbelievable moment in that entire film I I just wouldn't believe that that would happen you're right that seems really out of character for Ron to just, yeah, just casually pick up a rock and knock out his professor. <laughs> Jordan, we have this thing we do at the end of every episode where we kind of rank the teacher based on like whether we think on the offset grading, like do we think they are outstanding, requires improvement, etc. I guess because there are so many teachers in this film, maybe if we think about just Hogwarts as a school, if we were magical inspectors, if we were Umbridge, we were coming, we were ranking the school, what would we give it based on what we see this year? It depends whether you get the full picture that we see in the films, where we obviously know everything that's gone on, or whether, because I imagine that Dumbledore and sort of McGonagall, you know, the likes of Snape, those kind of, the senior leadership team, will be very, very good at pulling the wool over people's eyes. And I think the children, obviously, in the film, are clearly so loyal to that school that they would be on their best behaviour and they pull together and they make sure that they are fiercely loyal to that place and to a lot of those teachers. So I think they'd get away with it being outstanding. And and it, and it is kind of in the wizarding world, isn't it? It's seen as one of the best schools, you know, in, in, in the world out of all of them. But personally, yeah, I think there's a lot of safeguarding issues within it, us knowing what we know. But, you know, you've got people like uh, Lucius Malfoy, as much as he wants Dumbledore out of there, he's got all the money behind him, he's got all the power. I don't think he'd allow the school to get a bad grade in because, heaven forbid, that his son goes to a school that is requires improvement or something like that. He'd want to feel like he's going to the best. So I think they'd do quite well. I think you're absolutely right. And I think that flags up that the whole system is just stupid anyway because it's based on like a, a fake presentation of what a school is doing. And I think you're right. They'd be very good at pretending that everything they're doing is amazing when actually as we've seen the teaching is like super variable like you've got someone like McGonagall who's great someone like uh, Lockhart whose teaching is appalling even if they did get outstanding in my mind based on what happened in this year there surely must be some kind of ministry for magic like investigation into what on earth they did in terms of the Chamber of Secrets and how poorly they dealt with that situation. They must have handled it really poorly as well because in the last film Ron and Hermione go down there don't they? And the basilisk's corpse is just still there. It's just rotted (laughs) away. So clearly, they've not done anything about it. They've not thought, oh, well, this is a hidden chamber found in Slytherin House that has this, you know, incredible magical beast down there where, you know, its body parts must possess some sort of magical qualities, all this stuff. They've They've just left it. Like, surely you'd go down there and do a bit of excavation work or a bit of research. They've just got to close it again. So they've clearly just... Try to just sweep it under the rug, haven't they? They've just got to, 
that that that's dealt with now. <laughs> Forget about it. So true. I don't know how I've never thought about the fact that that's really weird that that snake is still there in the last film, which I guess does testify to the fact that actually they have managed to sweep it under the rug. So the Ministry of Magic are probably are like, so what happened here? And number does look absolutely nothing. Don't know what you're on about. What's what's Chamber Secret? It's it's strange that the kids wouldn't have said anything to their parents. Like, oh my gosh. You know, a kid got petrified and we had to wait till the mandrakes had matured to get them something. You know, surely in reality, you would have got a number of parents expressing concerns aside from Malfoy. And that Ofsted would have been triggered. Lots of questions there about how that would have played out. But every single year, they do a great job of covering up whatever the disaster is for that particular year. And Harry gets away with it and I guess before Harry turned up to the school they would have had this brilliant reputation things would always go smoothly every single year would go by without any major incidents I think it it might have been a a bit of a sigh of relief when Harry decided to leave kids who were just those Hufflepuffs or Ravenclaws that are just literally they started in the same year as Harry and they're just trying to get through their school years. They're just trying to get through their education. And then Harry's always in the background doing some mental stuff. And they're like, really, I just want to learn potions, like just in peace. Thanks. But yeah, I think they'd feel very much like a side character in their own life. Bless them. So what you said about sort of parents, obviously I'm primary school, but if a child goes home with a bruise on the knee, the school will get a phone call saying uh, this bruise has just shown up on so-and-so's knee what 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 happened and it's like well they're just kids so if if sort of parents are that fussy over a bruise you know let alone being petrified <laughs> to near death surely yeah someone would have got in touch <laughs> yeah i like to imagine that like can you imagine like the hogwarts my concern logs like we believe Ginny weasley may have been taken over by the spirit of Bol- voldemort through a book <laughs> we can't be sure this probably would require further investigation never picked up though well jordan thank you so much for joining us today no, thank you so much for having me where can people find you that's at mr firth but spell m-i-s-t-e-r on twitter or if you'd like to listen to our podcast we are uh, called hands up and do listen to Hands Up because it is an amazing podcast. It's very entertaining. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed that. Thank you for listening to us today. Follow us on social media. We're on Twitter at Film Class Pod and also on Instagram on the same handle. Also, you can send us an email at filmclasspod at gmail.com. Send us over any comments, any suggestions. Thank you so much as well to Kevin McLeod for our music, Night in Venice. You can find all of Kevin's work in Competech dot filmmusic.io and the license is at creative commons see you next week see ya